Good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I do have one quick confession, despite all the lovely experience that has just been mentioned. This is my first conference talk ever. So my mum's asked to take a photo, if that's okay. So I might just do that. If you, if you thumbs up is great, don't really mind. Should be very proud of me. This is all very well. And my second confession today is that I do love a good um, piece of entrance music. So Backstreet's Back, I think, was yours just then. Um, I was a backyard wrestler before my time in media, so I do love a good entrance music. Um, but no, we're here today to talk about a quite a provocative title, I think, uh, around gaming marketing is taking over the world. And again, in the theme of confessions, I don't typically like when uh, we sort of get that hy hyperbolic sort of statement going, like when brands want to own summer or they want to own afternoons and things like that. But I think in this particular case, gaming taking over the world is a good jump off point because it's a conversation that obviously I'm having in the work that I do now. And certainly in a previous life at Mediacom was brands looking to find a way into the gaming space. And it's a very long, long bow to draw. Everything from the media space all the way through to esports and everything in between. So that's what we'll cover today. If there are any really hot questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Lukewarm ones, wait till the end and I'm sure we'll get to them as we go. Um, but a little bit more about me. Um, so as mentioned, I spent 10 years at Mediacom. Uh, and doing a range of things, starting in partnerships and social media as sort of things started to progress in that space from about 2007 onwards. Um, but more recently, I joined Livewire about six months ago. It's a new business in general. It's about just under two years old, so everything's new, uh, and, and everything was sort of navigating at the same rate of pace that you guys are. We do consider ourselves experts, but it's only just. We know 10% more than probably a lot of you, and I imagine a lot of conversations are happening within agencies, within the clients in the room, and different partners uh, as well. And my role in particular is to help join the dots and build a narrative for brands in gaming. So if you've got a question around, look, I've got 10K, what can I do in media? I've got a million dollars, what can I do with esports and sponsorships? That's the length of bow that we're sort of drawing, I suppose, across the board for brands, and that's where I come in as the head of strategy uh, at Livewire here as well. So why gaming and why now? Um, as I mentioned, this is probably a conversation that's taking place quite a fair bit in various different capacities. Uh, and the first, um, the first reason, I suppose, it's sort of on the tip of the tongue at the moment is around this white space. Uh, and a lot of agencies that I've come across and a lot of brands that I'm working with are talking about cultural relevance, and it's an incredibly important point. And gaming has an abundance of it. With a few exceptions, of course, there are not many brands taking sort of the long-term approach in the, you know, within gaming, and that's both the ecosystem and tapping into the audience. So if you are looking at gaming and what can actually do as an opportunity, now is the time to do it. The next piece of the puzzle is ease of access. Uh, and we, we like to compare gaming, I suppose, and at least the ecosystem more broadly. I'll say ecosystem a lot first, so I apologize for that. But the ecosystem of gaming is effectively, um, you know, when you compare it to traditional sports, the ease of access becomes really quite apparent. So everything from access to talent, there's no seasonality around when you can sort of do things with different people. Um, you've got real-time content streams, so Twitch is a big part of the space, and we'll talk a little bit about that and the role that they play all the way through to no geographical boundaries. So we're sort of connecting the dots digitally with talent and the audiences that we're actually looking to tap into as well. Cultural crossover, absolutely massive. So what we're finding with the audiences, particularly at the youth stage, so 16 to about 30 at this point in time, is that the, the traditional sort of interest groups are shifting into music, fashion, and then gaming is a very large part of that as well. And what we're finding is if you can sort of find those cultural uh, um, transition points, I suppose, you have a really affecting, effective marketing strategy across the board to tap into those interest groups as well. And lastly, we'll talk a lot about audience scale. So it's no surprise that the momentum in the space is getting larger and larger and larger, with around about 17 million in Australia alone identifying as gamers. And the word gamers is quite subjective. Everything from you know, the hardcore, big headphones, RGB lights in the room, all the way through to your Candy Crush players as well is, is what we consider the gamer audience uh, in this country as well. So speaking about scale, um, it is an incredibly large audience. Um, three, three billion um, people globally, again, identify as gamers across that very long bow that I'm talking about. And then in APAC alone, about 1.6 billion. But when we start to get a little bit deeper into the space, uh, particularly in the Australian gaming landscape, um, the total audience sits at around 17 million. And this is everything from actually playing games all the way through to consuming content. I'm a pretty good proxy when it comes to this audience. I used to play a lot of sort of core gaming, spend hours and hours a day, but have since shifted into more content consumption, entertainment through VODs and Twitch and the like. So there's, again, that elasticity across the gaming audience is quite broad. 
74% of 16 to 74 year olds, 64 year olds rather, sorry, play video games in this country. You can sort of see there as well the audience breakdown. This is not just a youth endeavor. This is very much a broad, broad scope that we're dealing with here. 83 minutes uh, a day on average played, um, you know, 94 minutes for males and 70, 70 minutes for females there as well. And the skew is actually quite um, getting closer and closer. It was used to be a male dominated space, but now it's very close to being at parity, I suppose, with those who identify as females, males, et cetera, as well. And then interestingly, and probably more anecdotally, if you are looking at sort of content creation and how you build assets that, that sort of get in front of, of gamers in general, they are very clear when it comes to ad blockers and using VPNs. It increases very, very high when you're looking at esports. So if you are looking into that space, that's something you'll need to navigate a little bit more closely. But overall, um, the audience is very savvy when it comes to sort of uh, maneuvering around the ad space and the marketing messaging that, we've, that we try to create for them. So uh, starting sort of at the very beginning, how do we reference gaming? How do we speak to gaming in the industry, or at least how we define it? The first part is the ecosystem, as I mentioned. So it's a very challenging space for brands to decipher. And that's where I come in and sort of help sort of build that narrative around it. It's everything from the platforms, partners, you know, um, content, channels, et cetera. We do speak about metaverse and NFTs, not today. That's probably another couple of hours to talk about. But it's everything that encompasses how you can interact within the gaming space itself. Secondary to that is then the gaming audience. And this is sort of that 17 million people that I was speaking about before as well. So it's talking about the scale. Uh, and this is everything, as I mentioned, from players through to content consumers that make up all of those individual people that play in that ecosystem. So in terms of navigating gaming, so where do you begin? So most of the time, we start with a gaming audience where a brand will come to us and say, hey, we've got you know, a target audience of X, Y, Z. We think these are the habits, et cetera. And that's where we start. And the natural entry point, therefore, is then talking to the gaming media marketplace, which, as technology has advanced, is becoming easier and easier to tap into, whether it's programmatic, on console, PC, mobile, et cetera. That's the natural way in for most brands that I'm speaking to. Then around that, you've got a very, very large myriad of content players that also have a different point of view on how to interact with the space. So everything from talent and content. So uh, a lot of brands that we talk to have traditional influencer um, programs that they're working with. It's a very similar space to play in as well. It's just what content they're producing is usually through a live streaming environment and then amplified on content, um, social content channels as well. Game developers and game publishers. These are very similar entities, but they have very different um, roles in the, in the marketing space. A lot of times we come across, you know, a brief says, hey, we want to integrate into FIFA. We want to integrate into Call of Duty, which is absolutely possible. It just requires a lot of runway and a, a very large budget. It is possible, but these two players become very important when you're starting to talk about those deeper integrations. Gaming hardware, that's pretty standard. PlayStations, Xbox, mobile um, devices, and things like that. So they also have a, a role to play in the space as well and control a lot of the the IP regulation, regulatory sort of guidelines around that. Software providers, so this is a big one. Um, with the advancements of DLCs or downloadable content, um, we're finding that it's easier to integrate brands into the gaming space much more quickly. Previously, uh, and not too long ago, if you wanted to be in gaming in some capacity, you would have to get, get on the front foot very, very early and hard code your brand into the space. These days, through patches and, and other advancements and sort of serving content out and updating games quite regularly, this is becoming super simple through software updates as well, which allows people like me to have a job. Streaming services, so Twitch, as I mentioned earlier, um, they play a huge role, um, at least in sort of the content and talent space. Um, it is a very key piece of, of the gaming and streaming bubble, uh, but it is only the step off point. Uh, a lot of the time, the, the test and learn starts on Twitch, and then you sort of start to build out what gaming looks like for your particular entities over a longer period of time. And Twitch often forms a large part of that. Across uh, YouTube gaming is around. Facebook gaming is also becoming a thing. I think TikTok's now about to start making some plays in the space as well. So that space is very, very much a um, you know watch it and see as it starts to take shape. And then retailers and online stores. So obviously point of sale, we, we don't do a lot of that at the moment. But we have um, sort of stakeholders and partnership management sort of third parties that obviously handle a lot of those sort of promotions and tying products back into that particular space. And the reason I suppose we're having lots of conversations, um, and I won't read the stats on the screen, they're actually quite small, so apologies if you can't see them, um, but effectively we're finding that pop culture is very much gaming culture and vice versa. You're starting to see titles like Cyberpunk, Fortnite, and Netflix, obviously very sort of household names, particularly in gaming and obviously entertainment, starting to be shaped uh, across the space um, by gaming and then obviously gaming being influenced by those entertainment content pieces as well. 
You've got things like Cyberpunk, and these names may be familiar with you. Obviously, um, Keanu Reeves, very much a household name. But building these celebrity and ambassadors into games to then drive additional hype and additional engagement with the actual gaming base as well. Things like Henry Cavill in The Witcher series, obviously a very popular um, you know, gaming title and Netflix series in its own right. 76 million plus views, 50 million plus copies sold. So the numbers are quite staggering when you start to see those sort of cross-culture or pop culture references starting to take shape across the board. And then, of course, my favorite one here is probably Snoop Dogg. He's just completing all the side missions in life at this point in time. But it's, you know, these immersive and wide-scale pop culture integrations are popping up very, very regularly. And look, sure, these are the North Star in terms of integrations, right? Not everyone's got the cash to throw Snoop Dogg into different games. But what you're finding is when you're playing games and interacting, whether it's mobile, PC, and console, all of these pop cultural references are starting to form a large part of that entertainment ecosystem that, that, that games are building around. And if we stick to sort of two main ones at this point in time as just examples here, Fortnite with about 350 million registered users in 2021 alone, and Call of Duty generating about 15 billion in worldwide revenue, which is much larger than a lot of um, sort of uh, cinema studios like Marvel and DC and the like, Harry Potter franchise, etc. These are incredibly large numbers, which start to give you an idea of how gaming is shaping and, you know, to, to, in saying true to the title, starting to change the world and starting to change the way we interact within pop culture and within sort of the, the various ways that we consume content. Sticking with Fortnite, just again, sort of more anecdotally, just to give you an idea, and I would say Fortnite comes up the most when we're talking to different people about how to integrate into, um, into gaming itself, and I'll touch on why that is in just a moment. But when you're talking about the number one game played in sort of the, you know, the last three or four months or so in Australia, uh, staggering numbers around hours spent, which is actually you know, quite alarming in, in some cases, but certainly in terms of the entertainment value and people sort of jumping into the, into the game for different reasons, um, you know, it's a huge opportunity for brands to tap into. And depending on where your brand risk profile sits, Fortnite is typically the jump off point before you get into sort of the Call of Duties with guns and violence and things like that as well. So it's a pretty safe space. The reason why we're having these conversations a lot about Fortnite, and I think this is indicative of where the, the industry is headed more broadly, um, is Fortnite has built a platform not only that they have built you know, to entertain and based on what they thought would succeed, and obviously it has, but they've provided a platform for brands, for consumers, creators, et cetera, whether they're content creators or just, you know, you know the average Joes like me who just want to sort of explore their, their creative territories, is they've built a game that can be actually manipulated by its creator base and content you know, in a content series type way. And also from a sandbox perspective, that's where you start to get the Ariana Grande's doing concerts, Travis Scott's doing concerts, et cetera, because they've built it in a way that can be manipulated over time based on cultural trends. And this is, this is probably from a trend perspective where a lot of games will head, build the base game, and then provide a platform for brands, in particular commercially, it makes a lot of sense, but also the content creators and the player base to reinvent it over time. And that's incredibly important. It's not just a static entity that lives and dies based on its popularity. It can reinvent itself very, very quickly through the likes of game modes, a focus on um, you know, community and squads, and of course, gamification, rewards and glory, which is obviously a lot of the reason why the sort of more competitive players play for that progressive sort of stature. Another great example of um, how gaming is sort of, you know, elevating uh, itself across the world is, and, and this might be um, familiar to a lot of you in the room here, is, a is an organization, I call it a company because they've just, they've recently gone public, uh, FaZe Clan. Uh, and this was just started literally as a couple of content creators who were doing trick shots on, in various games quite a while back that saw an opportunity to sort of come together and form a more formalized organization around the content that they were creating. And today, I think their market cap sits at about 275 million. Um, you know, in the press, they were going for the, the first billion dollar content creation organization, which is quite staggering. And I'm not sure if they got to those lofty heights, but still, it serves, it serves a point by saying, across all of these major gaming titles, and, create, and then content creators off the back of that, there's a huge opportunity and a wave of momentum around sort of lifestyle influences, gaming influences, and how they intersect. Um, you know, the, these guys are massive, uh, a massive player in the space, and Australia doesn't necessarily have, you know, the scale that a FaZe Clan has, but certainly I'm sure as sort of gaming starts to follow the waves of momentum, it'll likely increase into something like this. We do have a lot of good talent creators, but from an organizational perspective, it's, it's not quite at that point. 
Here's some quick examples here. So some of, um, some of my favorites, I suppose, that I've come across which sort of serve to show how different brands can show up and different organizations can show up in gaming itself. Mercedes made a big eSports play, um, you know, with League of Legends, uh, you know, playing it for the long term, which is something that I encourage. If you are having that conversation around brands, think about what that long term play is rather than sort of those tactical campaigns that live and die quite quickly. Balenciaga and Fortnite, so this is more in the NFT sort of digital asset space, but they created digital assets that also exist in real life and bringing those two things together. I think fashion and gaming at the moment is probably seeing the most integration, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, you've got Burger King uh, and the Whopper, so this is more of that point of sale style integration as well. So they decided to partner up with Call of Duty for in-game rewards and incentives based on purchase behavior uh, in, in the actual um, retail setting as well. And then Vans, um, a bit of backstory there, and I'll, I'll share some, I've got a case study sort of document that um, anyone's interested in, I can share more detail on these as well, because they are quite interesting. Um, but Vans and Roblox, so rather than Vans going to Tony Hawk, which would likely be quite expensive given his stature in the skating space, they thought, let's use Roblox, which does skew slightly more youth, to build a space for Vans to actually build an immersive experience around that culture to build it up over time uh, as well. Some more tactical ones, you might have seen the Wendy's Fortnite one. So Wendy's, um, sort of their mantra is obviously against frozen beef. Uh, and they worked out that Fortnite, the, you know, the digital restaurants that were in the Fortnite space, stored their beef in frozen fridges. Um, so they decided to do a bit of a tactical campaign with a character in the actual Fortnite experience that looked a lot like their logo and went around to destroy those frozen beef freezers and built content around that. So quite tactical, but it blew up over time and, and did incredibly well from, from a generated media perspective. DHL, so obviously delivery service, um, they partnered um, with some esports leagues to be their official, um, uh, official partner, I suppose, in getting their stages from venue to venue across the globe. And of course, they built in some gaming tactical activations at venue as well. Something we've been involved with, I say we as Livewire, um, for Five Gum uh, for Mars Wrigley. So they've decided, again, at a local level, let's start with the talent play into community and sort of intersecting and giving people a reason to play in the space, uh, enjoy gaming with, um, with gum at the sort of the center, being that chewing gum apparently, and the study suggested increases concentration and focus, so that was kind of the natural link there for them. And then KFC, quite a strange example, um, but a good one in, in my head. They effectively decided to create a console with a bit of a PR tactic that could warm and heat your chicken as you gamed. It was a functional PC. Uh, it's a very high-end PC, believe it or not, it actually works. There's a website, you can look it up, it, it's there and, and it, it's all there to see. But again, a bit of a tactical play, but giving, sort of adding value, I suppose, to the gaming audience and probably understanding that gamers at that particular time, Call cool Gamers, KFC was sort of a natural skew for obvious reasons as well. But activating and gaming can actually be quite simple. So those, those examples there are quite North Star orientated in terms of, yes, very large integrations. But there are ways into gaming that make um, much more sense if you're sort of dipping the toes in and wanting to test and learn. Everything from in-game creative, so a couple of examples there on the slide are around sort of digital assets finding their way into the, for the gaming audience. Social and content creative streams, um, that's very heavily linked to talent and partners, so a lot of the fuel for gaming comes from the content space, which is, um, which is quite obvious. Um, custom experiences and builds, so that's the Roblox, the Fortnite type stuff that's starting to get a little bit more immersive um, as it builds up over time. Conferences, activations, so second half of this year we've got PAX and DreamHack back on the schedule. Um, you know, and everyone's very excited to get people back you know, in a physical venue um, for once um, after having sort of obviously through, through COVID and whatnot um, not being able to do so. Esports and then cross-brand partnerships sort of round out the space. So there's different ways into gaming that don't involve large esports, large integrations, large cost sort of um, production centers around talent and all of those things. There are ways in to tap into a very large scaled audience of that 17 million, as I said before, at various, at various levels. We talk a lot about cultural relevance and we also talk a lot about the attention economy. Um, and here again, it's just sort of more data points to jump, in, jump back into why gaming at the moment. Um, gaming holds a very disproportionate amount of attention versus the dollars spent. And this is, again, just to serve the point that the white space currently, and this is global data, but it serves as a really good proxy, that the, the, the dollars being spent in gaming do not match the attention that it commands at this point in time. So if you're looking to do it, now is the time before it starts to, the wave starts to get bigger and bigger and more brands start to sort of cloud the space, particularly in the APAC and ANZ regions. From a channel perspective, um, you know, gaming definitely goes beyond play. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of content consumption going on within the gaming space. I'll log on to Twitch, 
maybe once every couple of days and just literally consume gaming content without picking up a controller at all. And this is, this is reflective across a lot of the different audience groups that we're, and I'll go into some segmentation in the next slide, but if you are looking at building a plan around gaming, it's very important to consider not just the interaction side of it with the controller, but also the channel mix that you're building around that. We often talk to brands about an extension of their out of home strategy, you know, into out of home style placements in gaming, or an extension of their audio strategy, so radio and Spotify and the like and those types of things. You can build audio into games as well without interrupting the experience. So there's a lot of ways that you can start to tap into gaming and how that plays uh, in the space. Segmentation, uh, as I alluded to, so, Particularly in Australia, we've got a very wide mix of why people um, can, like, interact and consume gaming content. Um, the, the largest ones there are the time filler and the lapsed gamer, so that's more of the casual gaming market that sits underneath that. Um, but above that, you've sort of got nothing really jumps above 10 when it comes to why people game. So you've got the ultimate gamers, you've got the all-round enthusiasts and things like that. So again, it just serves a point to say if you are thinking about gaming, there is a broad set of interest groups that you can tap into based on what you're trying to say or the assets you're trying, trying to build. So we start at the top of the tree uh, in terms of, in terms of esports. So the global growth by segment there, it's pretty obvious, it, it's massive. Uh, and again, in Australia, the esports scene doesn't have a large scale. There's a couple of organizations um, like Chief Esports and Order and things like that, which have very high credibility in esports and gaming in Australia, but the scale is yet to be there. It will likely increase uh, as things naturally do uh, as the momentum builds. Um, but these guys at, e at the esports level, if you're looking to build credibility and build an affinity in sort of that high-end gamer, that's obviously where you'd start. Second down from that, you've got competitive gamers, so not quite competing at a professional level in, so in terms of organised esports spaces. Um, but this is considered the premium audience, so they lean, I guess, to the latest technology, not just from a com you know, um, PC and computers type stuff, but they, we do see a skew into the more premium audience, or the premium brands, I suppose, across the board. Um, these guys are very heavily concerned with progression and personal achievement, so they may not be live streaming to you know, thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people, but they're, they're, they're driven, I suppose, by gaming personal progression and that gamification space as well. And they're very, very immersed in gaming culture, as you can imagine. Where we start to see more scale uh, is in the creator and talent space. So these guys obviously are very heavily um, you know, into their content and communities, and they are influencers in their own right. So again, speaking about a traditional influencer approach, which is obviously um, you know, a part and parcel of a lot of plans in, in, in branding at the moment, these guys are the gaming equiv equivalent of that as well. So they are very powerful entertainers, not just in gaming, but also lifestyle. Um, Twitch will speak a lot about sort of, yes, it is a, a, at its core a game streaming service, but the just chatting category, often through gaming talent, is just as big, just literally chatting and conversing with their communities that they've built up over time. Very loyal and very protective communities, I must add, as well. So if you are jumping into live streaming and integrating into that space, you've got to add value on both sides of the equation, which is easy to do. you just got to think about it and not forget that you're entering into a space where brands are often celebrated but can be kicked away if you're not doing it in the right manner. And then lastly, the casual and content stuff. So this is the gaming masses. So this is where you're starting to see more um, mobile um, participation starting to take place. Your candy crushes the world and sort of more hyper casual gaming comes into the fray. Um, you know, it's a, it's a variety of titles. It's a variety of devices and platforms. This, this particular segment, we tend to hit through mobile and a little bit of console uh, as well. And like influencers, there are tiers. It's not separated by the size of the network or the scale, but this is kind of how we, and it's you know, subjective in a sense that um, this is how we tend to do it and start to navigate the space, but you can sort of start to see that hierarchy of how gaming comes together uh, across the board. There are crossovers, I will say that, so just because you're an esports player doesn't mean you're not a content creator and vice versa, uh, but it just helps to kind of segment these guys out when you are looking at why gaming and why it might make sense um, for you guys if you are looking at the space. Passions, so somewhat, um, passions are somewhat illogical in many ways, um, but the gaming audience, obviously, the passion for gaming has what we think is two sort of main, main classifications. The first being gameplay focus, so those who are sort of very, um, very um, into their sort of achievement hunting, competitive players, the casual players, et cetera, looking at how they can actually progress within gaming. And then, of course, as I keep mentioning as well, is that content space probably more where I sit at this point in time. It's about sort of understanding the story and enjoying the narrative of gaming, watching others compete, watching others play, and sort of that whole um, ecosystem. There's that word again, I suppose, of actually enjoying gaming for what it is, broader than just picking up the controller over time. 
Content and community shifts. So this is a big one. So obviously with that content and gameplay type sort of classification, what we're seeing more broadly and, up and, and you know, quite recently, you know, the, the snackable economy, I suppose, or the content economy, platforms like um, TikTok are actually seeing large spikes in gaming related content. So live streaming, yes, serves as a, a sort of that foundational player for entertainment and content consumption for a gaming sort of audience. What we're finding is the community scale and growth and opportunity from creators is shifting into very short form content. Everything from highlights, clutch moments, um, you've got Easter eggs, unboxing. So TikTok is a very large channel that is sort of being elevated, I suppose, and vice versa, to be fair. When you start seeing these numbers around gaming, gaming setup, gameplay, and TikTok gaming, the views and the engagement is staggering. So the, the, the broader amplification plan around gaming, starting potentially with talent, into live streaming, into content creation, into TikTok, into Instagram, and all those other things, is incredibly important to remember because content is being consumed on non-gaming platforms, at least at this point in time. TikTok obviously is not a gaming-specific platform, but the content consumption around, the, around gaming is absolutely massive. Strong device usage, I won't sp spend too much time um, around this, but we've got a very strong device usage across the board uh, in Australia, led by console. We are console heartland. Um, you know, we are seeing sort of slight shifts, um, you know, console trading places with PC, which is quite interesting. Uh, again, PC gaming at a core level um, was probably where most of the gaming audience sat, at least at a default mindset for a very long time. But now that lean back experience around console is starting to take shape. Um, obviously with mobile as well, um, very strong mobile numbers, um, not as strong as other APAC regions, um, other markets like Singapore, heavily mobile markets, um, but in this particular case, um, we've got a pretty, pretty strong and pretty even split uh, across the board. It's not that important around why or where or why people are playing games, it only becomes interesting when you're looking at sort of production and where you're starting to, um, to place those assets as well. Most streamers and most talent will use a PC to create content, but again, that's not that important if you're talking about talent. It becomes more important when you're starting to serve ads and assets to, to an audience that sort of skews in different ways. They're very high value audiences as well. Um, so again, this is not just a youth endeavor. We've got high education levels, high income levels across the board. So very high value audience depending on, on the brands you're working with or the brand that you are. Again, the, the, the split around the age groups. So it is not just a, you know, a, a Gen Z, although it's very highly skewed there at 90%. It's not just a Gen Z endeavor. Millennials, Gen X and beyond. The gaming audience is very broad, very mixed. A lot of different interest groups and very, very large. Household entertainment, um, so this was um, a bit of data that was done obviously um, off the back of COVID. I found it quite interesting sort of why parents play. That, that's an interesting one as well around audience groups and, and why people are interacting in the space. Um, connection is obviously a key theme across the board. Children ask me to play with them, probably stock standard. Um, and again, connection with children there comes up quite strongly. Um, and again, education, which um, you know, you may not think about gaming as an education piece, but it's certainly the gamification elements and the, the platform around that can be tapped into to, to provide hyper-casual games that actually educate and inform over time. Just to sort of wrap up the next couple of slides, um, gaming is no different to any other strategic endeavor, I would say. So you're still looking for sort of what the brand has to say, what culture is currently trending, and what sort of um, what ideas are, are landing, I suppose, in the minds of your consumers. And then, of course, what's happening in gaming. Gaming changes, not so much daily, but certainly weekly, um, with the releases of content, gaming titles, the way people are interacting. It's very much a, you know, a ebb and flow, I suppose, of cultural trends, and being on top of that is something that we, we help brands with. Um, to obviously find that sort of sweet spot, leveraging all of those cultural tension points to work out why gaming, why can we add value, and how can we create things that actually matter to different people. Uh, and to finish on a very quick example, so this was something um, that, that Livewire or Brad did, for those who came in to see Brad, I apologize, but Brad, um, when he was working with the Crows at AFL, my CEO and co-founder, um, effectively they thought, okay, obviously everyone's in lockdown, we've got access to talent that we never had before in the AFL, let's build something that can actually raise money for charity, um, you know, bring talent together, bring the community together in a really, really entertaining community-led format. Um, and, you know, and the numbers there obviously speak for themselves. So when, when it's done right, when you start thinking about all those tension points and how you can add value and entertain your consumer base, thing, you know, the magic happens, I suppose, uh, across the board. But that's me. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, you've been a very attentive audience for my first time, so thank you for that. There's many other speakers to come, but thank you so much.
Sorry, Alex. Thanks. Uh, so all of our speakers today will be receiving a bottle of Barossa Shiraz from the beautiful Yolumba. So thank, you, thank so you, Chris, so much. Thank you so much. Ta. And now I'd love to open the floor. Has anyone got any questions on gaming, marketing, esports for Chris? How easy is that? Yeah, uh, awesome. All right, we've got one down the front. Uh, now, do we have a roving mic? Yep. Wait for the roving mic. Sorry, we're still getting used to the new venue. Um, Is this working? Uh, yes, testing, testing. testing. Right down testing. The front. All the way here, Jen. You got to run, 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 run. I should get double steps on my. Yeah, I was going to say, you counting your steps. Check. Who has the question? Hello, uh, awesome presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Very enlightening for us. We're in the agribusiness sector, so yep. quite different. Um, but I was wondering, how easy is it for a business or organisation to create their own game? So they mm. own the game and have their audience play it versus, I guess, that north star of yeah. integrating into other gaming. That's a very, very good question, a very hard one to answer. Um, I would say there's two ways of going about it, um, and I'll start with the easiest way to do it. Um, we have a lot of conversation with brands who are in that space. We want to create an experience and a game that you know, serves a purpose for a brand message or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, the way we start is partnering with an existing platform like a Roblox or Fortnite or where there's creative outputs that you can actually manipulate in a way that works for your brand. I suspect you're asking more of the blank canvas question around how do we do something from absolute scratch. I would say it's only as easy as the partners you've got. And what I mean by that is it is an expensive endeavor, depending on how, how crazy you want to go. There's hyper-casual games like mobile apps and things like that, which are easy to do. I think there's a bit of audience analysis to be done around where your potential audience base is playing. If it is on console, it gets quite difficult, quite expensive, and, and quite, um, quite uh, tricky to navigate. Mobile, much simpler. If you're looking just for a quick, easy app build, very, very simple. I say simple, it's probably a bit flippant of me, but yes, there are mobile app creators um, that can help you with what the strategy is, what the, object, the objective or gamification in that game is to then tick a box for the audience. But yeah, it, like most things in gaming, if you, if, you, if you think it, you can build it. It's just sort of where on that spectrum do you want to play, starting with mobile, PC gaming a little bit easier, and then console you get into some pretty serious space, like there's farm simulators and other things like that, which are very simple games, but probably quite complex to build. Um, but yes, a, a very good question. Uh, looks like we've got some more questions. Awesome. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, I guess we're sitting in Adelaide specifically. What are the opportunities that are occurring in the space now for integration at a more localised level? You talked about, obviously, APAC and ANZ. Yeah. Um, but for local area, um, you, you mentioned the integration with out of home. Like, yeah. what is the option in the space at a more localised level? Yeah, sure. So that largely exists within the marketplace, I will say. Um, so to, to talk creds at this point in time without going too much into the sales piece. Um, but the, at a marketplace level, um, we've got around about five and a half million device IDs, for example, that we can then target in the same way you would target your digital media assets. So we've done um, work, you know, Sonic, I think, was one of the examples up there where we targeted to local cinemas, for example, and can measure footfall off the back of that. So at a local level, like hyper-local level, the media assets, the digital media space is where, where you would play. As it gets broader, naturally, um, you're starting to get audience groups that start to filter out that we've got Australian content creators that have largely US followings, for example. So in the same way you'd, you know, um, uh, logically rationalise influ a traditional influencer, we do the same with gaming. But yeah, the hyper-local stuff, I would start with device IDs, media assets and target that way. And then if you are looking to build a more immersive experience, you can use that foundation to you know, bring people back into that potentially or do custom integrations that serve Adelaide or Sydney, Melbourne, etc. I actually have a, a question for you, Chris. Mm -hmm. So if we kind of look at the, I guess, old school kind of sponsorship in a way, like, um, like I'm just thinking about AFL teams and mm -hmm. things like that, where you're like, okay, part of the deal is you just get your logo slapped on a person or on the team's mm -hmm. Guernsey. Mm -hmm. How effective is that kind of um, sort of, I guess, 
like if you're not doing the kind of immersive experience or not investing in the experience, yep. but you're kind of doing more of like a placement type mm -hmm. partnership, which is probably closer to traditional. Yep. Um, have you seen that to be effective or, you know, how does that kind of rate on the scale? Yeah, um, I think it's effective in the, when it's done in the right way. Um, I, I think eSports... Um, with, a, with a, again a couple of a couple of exceptions, the esports space is largely dominated by endemic brands in gaming. So either tech providers, um, you know, you see, sometimes the Puma sponsors, I think, order for their, you know, their kit and stuff like that. So there is a natural link between whether it's performance, whether it's premium nature, or things like that. So that's quite effective. Um, I would say if you've if if you're thinking gaming is esports and then you're going the logo slapping thing, there's nothing beyond that. You know, I don't have the data in front of me, but I would say that's not as effective as working out the why than working out the how in, yeah. in that order. Yeah. Um, we're seeing uh, a lot of brand partnerships and working with a lot of brands in, in those partnership endeavours to say, okay, yeah, sure, there's a lot of placements around talent, live streaming, content assets, where yes, your logo will be slapped on an asset, but what is, what is the natural loop, I suppose, as to, to driving to driving that, um, that, that brand message and that brand value. So utilizing Twitch chat functionality, for example. Um, we've recently um, you know, become Uber Eats, for example, is a good example. Their sort of gaming agency, I suppose. So working out how do we use a logo slap on a live stream to then drive people into that, into that um, e-commerce platform, into ordering, and then track that back as well. So look, there, there's effectiveness on different ends of the scale. I would say work out the why, and then we can help you work out the how. That's always sound advice, I think, no matter what platform you're looking at. Precisely. Figure out why, figure out your audience, and then uh, figure out the best way to get to them. And yep. I guess uh, today we've found that, you know, gaming is, a, is an option. Um, Absolutely. looking for your audience. Were there any other questions from the floor? Yep, there looks like there's one at the back of the room where the roaming mic run off to. Yep, here we go. Hey, how's it going? Um, my name's Daniel, I work for a company called Seller. We play in the connected packaging space, so basically bridging physical products with a digital experience. Yep. Yep. Is anyone doing anything in the space for gamification where um, they're creating, I suppose, digital pairs with physical products? So you talk about sort of like NFT, things like, is anyone buy a T-shirt, a physical T-shirt, as well as a digital one for your, your character, things in that sort of space? Yeah, it's definitely happening. Um, we're very much in our infancy, so I don't have any examples that I can speak to in a granular detail, but definitely it's worth a chat over a beer, I'm sure. Um, we have a partner called Block Trust, um, which works in the NFT space and is far more versed in understanding how digital physical assets come together in that brand narrative, which is um, something that we're finding incredibly interesting. Um, the, the value of NFTs in a gaming context is probably yet to take shape. Um, it has a, a fair bit of backlash um, from the community, at least in the gaming sense at this point in time. The example I gave, or at least showed from, from um, Burger King there, is the example that is top of mind, at least from the presentation around in-store physical asset on product linking into a digital space. Um, I can absolutely do some digging for you around physical product, t-shirt, etc., into that, because I'm sure they exist. I just haven't come across them uh, as yet, so I apologize for that, but something I'll look into and, and connect with you on for sure. Uh, we're very fortunate. Chris is here for the next two days, so please do catch him in the breaks. He's at the networking drinks tonight. Um, so if you do have any other follow-up questions and want to talk into the detail, uh, he's around, so please do uh, make uh, the most of him. Uh, were there any other questions from the floor? Before we close off, yep, over here. Chris Cryptic. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It is. It Excellent. is. We're gonna have to find you. It's not hard to find, unfortunately. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, I think we're coming up towards the end of the session. If there weren't any more questions, uh, please put your hands together. Thank you so much, Chris Johnson. Ah, my pleasure, my pleasure.